some shelves in the basement. I came across a piece uh, that I made and I can't, it was probably sometime in the 90s. Um, I don't really recall what the motivation was for it and, and, uh, and whatnot, but um, it was a, a little thin vase um, and I don't even have it anymore, but it's, it's based on a form, something like this, that is pulled on a, a, on a beer. stick. Um, and so I'm going to attempt to do that on live here because uh, I've made a lot of these, but um, we'll see how this we'll see how this goes. Um, okay, so. Uh, one one second, please. Let yeah. me just interrupt and and ask everyone to to please um, turn their mics off unless they have a question. Um, and that will that'll just help with background noise. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, I did a workshop over in Spokane, um, and one of the uh, participants, I was, I was doing something and he said, oh, you need to try this for a tool. <laughs> and this is a drumstick. It's got a little <laughs> nylon head on it. Um, but I, I thought this is really useful. I've got a bunch of stuff that, you know, mm -hmm. tools and things. Is that in his um, studio? Can you plug this in with that thing down Let's there? see. Someone's... Is that long enough? Um, are you almost out of gas? I will be. Okay. Someone's chatting. That plug in. Yeah, we can unplug this. Yeah. <laughs> are we good? Uh, no, I can't figure out. It looks like everyone's speak. Uh, mic is off, but... I don't know who it is. I think it's Miles. It probably is. Miles? Stop it. Ah. Hello? <laughs> yeah, yes, Miles. Can you hear turn me? Your, turn your mic off. Yeah. I don't even know how to turn my mic okay, off. Okay, I can do it from here. <laughs> Done. Okay. Okay, um, we're good. All right. So here's uh, clay on a stick. Um, Ken, I, I see the recording um, box there. So it's kind of blocking my um, my view of what I'm doing. It's, it's the notice that says the meeting is being recorded. Yeah. Oh, do I need you to do something. You can just hit. Uh, continue. Okay. Continue. Sorry. Oh yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, okay. So once you know, once I put the clay on the stick, then if I roll it, so that loosens the stick up. I can maybe put. Let me do that a little bit. More. So just like rolling a coil, that makes the hole bigger. And I can put something else bigger. And if I roll that, okay, so now this is loose on here. You can see how much bigger the hole is. Um, if I then just kind of squeeze this on the, squeeze this on the stick and stretch it. Continue this stretching. And 
squeezing it to the stick. And then to shape it, just gonna pull it like a be pulling a handle. And this will stretch it a little further. At this point, it's, it's, the clay is wanting to, to uh, stick to the, the wooden dowel. Um, so, I'm going to dry this off a little bit. Roll it a little bit more and then I can pull it off and here I think I might think I need this a little bit longer. Um, I could leave it round or I could shape it so that it's square. I kind of like the square profile. So. Reed, Nancy would like to know what clay body you're using. Um, so I have uh, one, two, three different clay bodies going in the studio at the same time. Um, I use uh, CAC from Clay Art Center uh, for the fake ash, kind of my production line. Um, I also um, am doing um, a thing with... Uh, a chino on a black uh, background. I use a dark clay uh, DRSM, and um, and then this is for the uh, the soda firing that I'm doing. This is Welmer. Um, those are all clay art center clays, and they're all cone ten. All cone ten, yeah. Yeah, I'm one of the still. <laughs> You're the holdout. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm shaping this so that the profile is square. I'm going to loosen, loosen this. Okay, so I think maybe you can see that. So, profile is square. I can still come down through here and pinch this thin the walls here So I have a little bit of a wider base, something this narrow, having a nice wide base would be a good thing. And then I'll maybe put a slight curve into it. 
I like the kind of live edge of the uh, top here. So I'm just going to put this aside, let this get leather hard, and then I'll finish it. Um, I made a couple of these today, so um, I, I can kind of work on these and get them finished. I need my handy dandy Sureform tool. And awesome tool. Yeah, these are great. And I'll clean up the edges here. Or the sides, I guess. I can't really see the shavings coming off of that, but it sounds pretty dry. Uh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> sitting outside in the sun most of the <laughs> afternoon. I was gone uh, out, uh, out of town yesterday, so I, I would have done this and it would have been in a little better shape. To work on, uh, but I was I wasn't here. Okay, so so are you trying to like emphasize the the squareness of the form? Now? Yeah, so I'm just taking the kind of uh, flattening uh, the sides um, because right now they're they're a little concave. Um, the edges are kind of round, and so I just want to square square this up. Wow, you can hear that, Ken. That's this mic is really great. It's picking everything up. Okay, so um, I think that will do uh, as far as I'm going to go with the sure form. Typically, tools arranged for this and then um, but that was like two weeks ago so <laughs> <laughs> they're long out of out of uh, range right. okay so you look a lot more organized than I <laughs> it's an illusion yeah um, it's working it's a small studio so everything's sort of you know I can grab it um, so I'll use the sure form to flatten the bottom and then I'm just going to take some of this excess clay away. Slab here. What is your attaching medium? Um, so this is um, that magic water formula the, with the sodium silicate and the 
So the ash, water. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've never really tested against again, you know, done a scientific test, but it, it seems to work. So you know, going with it. I think it works amazingly well. I tried Pat Horsley's. Have you tried Pat Horsley's? Um, what does he call it? No, no scratch or anything. No. The, 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 stuff, the stuff that's got, what does it have in it? It's got something in it that after about a week starts to um, go bad. Oops. Uh oh. It's my ear. Ear bud. <laughs> okay. So uh, a little slip. Go bad in terms of it. It starts to stink, or d yeah, uh, it does? Yeah, it's, it's not. It's not a good thing. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it might work. It might work really well, but if you're not doing a lot of it, don't make it. Yeah. Okay. So here we go. Trim that up. And I like using a roller to compress the clay. So even though I cut that, you know, nice and even by compressing it with this roller, I can push a little clay out on the sides and I can actually push it up the side. And then I'll just blend this in. And I have a tendency to overwork the surfaces of, of, of things that I do. Um, I'm trying to um, get more comfortable with maybe leaving some of these marks. Um, so um, we'll see. But typically, I would take a scraper, smooth the surface, um, and then... <clears throat> Be right back. So I could take this, the scraper to it to get rid of the marks from the sure form. And I'll moisten it and then use one of these green scrubby pads to sand it down. And that gives you a pretty nice surface. Um, it, it tends to pull the grog out of the clay, so it doesn't 
leave a lot of scratchy lines. Um, so for, for vapor firings, you have a nice clean surface. Um, you, know, you don't have a lot of groggy, uh, groggy bits. So, um, yeah, so this, I would, you know, have to finish up uh, the bottom here. Um, but as far as the, you know, the forming of it, um, I would kind of clean up some of these sharp edges here. But I like this live edge. Yeah, I like that as well. Yeah. I think it adds so, a little character to the pieces. Yeah, yeah. I want it to, to have some kind of liveliness to it. Um, Okay, so that's that's this process, and you know I try to when I do workshops, um, uh, I try to tell people that it's not so much about like replicating what I'm doing, but it's it's taking the idea of of maybe you know working on. Um, What do they call it when you have uh, uh, kind of internal support on a sculpture? Oh, armature. Uh, armature, like working on an armature for clay uh, that you know allows you to to create something that's you know a little more uh, like in this case something that's kind of fluid, um, uh, you know. But you're not you're not uh, you. I mean, you're not with with this uh, there's i think a lot of different um ways to use this idea to make other forms right yeah um, they can integrate that technique into some of the some of the work that they're creating to right to right. you know vary it so it, with that in mind i you know i um In other words, don't make reed spots. Make your well, own. You... <laughs> uh, let's see. So how did the, um, I'm trying, the, the reed, the reef work out. Did you, uh, oh, set? that's, that's coming up on the 25th. Oh, I thought you did that last weekend. Oh, okay. Um, I'm sorry. Well, we kind of scope things out. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, it's the, the real things going in on the 25th. Cool. Do you want to share what you're doing? Um, yeah. So uh, a few years ago, I was commissioned to make um, these uh, earthenware egg-shaped vessels um, that were meant as uh, water storage and dispenser. And uh, with earthenware, um, typically it's not water uh it's not vitreous, so the water seeps into the clay. Um, the water evaporates from the surface of the clay and it cools the water. That evaporation um, reaction cools the water. Um, so I was, you know, I was commissioned to make a couple dozen of these. I overfired them so they were vitreous and so the whole <laughs> thing didn't work. So I'm stuck with a, like, you know, two dozen of these. Um, egg shapes about this tall um, and I couldn't just throw them away 
And so I thought, um, what can I do with them? In the 70s, my grandparents went to Japan. They came home with a pot that was covered in barnacles. And that pot was an octopus pot. And in Japan, they fish for octopus using a line of ceramic pots. They put in the water, they let the they let it sit for some period of time, and then they pull it up, and each pot has an octopus in it. So I thought, oh well, we'll do that. We'll just put you know, I'm not gonna fish for octopus, but we'll just put these out in the bay someplace and um and uh, make a habitat for something. Right. So anyway, that's our plan for uh, low tide on the 25th. Is we've, we've got a spot scoped out and we're going to, um, we're going to put a bunch of pots out and create a little artificial reef. That'll be cool. Yeah. Make so, sure you get uh, good, lots of photos. Yeah. And don't tell shoreline management. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. <laughs> No. <laughs> okay, so um, anyway, so I've got, you know, this hollow form. Um, Ozaki Properties is uh, moving in. <laughs> <laughs> be some nice residents there. Yeah, that would be, that would be kind of cool. So, so you're taking a different approach with this one. Yeah, so rather than just pulling it out and making it square, I'm just trying to uh, work with what I've got. So it's a little thin on this side. Um, so I might have to leave, you know, this one side. So you, so you can see it's a little bit thin up here, thicker down here. So I'm taking a, some of the clay off with a twisted wire. Um, so yeah, uh, again, so same, you know, same kind of idea. Um, again, I like the live edge. Can you see that? Yeah, we can't see that. <laughs> yeah. oh. No, that's not good. Okay. There you go. There we go. Oh, look. Nice. There we go. Um, okay, so how are we doing for time? You can take as much time as you like. Okay. Um, well, I've got one other thing that I wanted to do. And um, this, this thing developed as a as an exercise in a workshop that was given by, I think it's Jill Fanshawe Cotto. Um, she's a UK ceramic artist. Oh, yeah, and she familiar. was touring the US um, back in the 90s. And um, she came to TCC and um, part of her presentation was um, to do, you know, take, take sort of the, the least amount of fussiness to create, um, you know, to create something out of clay. And um, so my, my solution to that problem was, I, uh, we had a bunch of little hump molds like this that we have students make bowls on or plates. Um, and I took that and I took, clay 
And originally, what I did was I just put this, put the clay in the bowl and just started to make a bowl. Um, sort of uh, kind of refine that a little bit. And um, so what I've got, I know you probably can't see this, but um, what I've got here, so there's a wire right here that this is hanging on. Um, and this is a twisted wire. Typically, uh, normally this is over on my wedging table, but I put it here just for this uh, demo. Thank you. Um, and so I'm gonna slice into this and with the twisted wire, maybe you can see that. No. You hold it up there and hold it still for a minute. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So you can see the texture from the twisted wire. Um, my goal is to preserve that. Okay, so now I've got this chunk of clay. The edges all have some of that um, texture from the wire. And now, um, cornstarch. So my tool doesn't stick to the clay. Done. Nice. I love it. <laughs> Actually, um, I can't. I can't not do more to it. But <laughs> you get the you get the sense, right? Yeah. Um, um, you know, the only thing you need to be careful of is where I put my needle. You know, it's going too, making this too deep. Um, but there's a quarter inch there in the bottom, and then I can work. work outwards um, yeah I love this technique so depending on the shape of your mold and how far you want to push the clay. These things um, will almost always have some cracks in them um, just because they're so thick. Um, I don't mind that. Yeah. And, um, so because, you know, because it's such an interesting edge. Uh, so. Um, That's beautiful. That really yeah, so is. I is love it. it. Yeah. Um, so there's that, uh, you know, uh, I would clean up the back side of this. And then I've never 
put these on feet. I just like firing them so that they they have their own uh, they find their own gravity sort of. Well, it's um, super low profile, so you probably don't have to worry about knocking yeah. them over. Yeah, I would actually like it to to maybe do this sometime, and I you know have it have it be less even you know. Uh, horizontal, yeah, and be more diagonal. So um, you just we'll have to work on that. You got one right there. Just slam it in in the side. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, you know, again, um, a technique in in search of um, you know some new ideas. Um, uh, we're making right it's it's uh, uh, a very simple very quick um, um, uh, interesting uh, textures and edges um, and uh, one can you know uh, put their own spin on it um, and uh, you know create create something uh, Maybe yeah. even more interesting than this. So, <laughs> um, well, yeah. Um, uh, I don't know necessarily about more interesting than that. You, you definitely have uh, a way with clay, and uh, I've so enjoyed the different firing uh, glaze applications that you've done over the years, mm. and how you've you know the surfaces that you've that you've used. I, you know, I've been really fortunate in in the fact that I've been able to um, to to make a line of work, and and Ken, you've done this too. I mean, um, you've got different different lines of, of things that you followed. Um, you know, with when I first started out, I was doing this decorated porcelain with brushwork. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, I've gone through three or four four different um, uh, iterations of my work. Right now I'm juggling three different things. Um, but I've always, you know, I've, I've been fortunate in that I've been able to sell the work that I like to make. Um, and I haven't been forced by the market or whatever to, you know, to do a single thing. Um, um, and that is a blessing. Anyway out um, what I just did yeah, any of my other work um, um, or you know just uh, questions about um, you know making pots for a living I um, uh, yeah if anyone has any questions please um, unmute yourself and ask away yeah. Hi, Reed. Hi. Nice to see you. Yes. Hey, I'm really curious about that stuff you used for a slip. You know, I'm not familiar with that. Um, um, and I'm not, I'm not aware of the origin of this recipe, um, but I have it written down so I don't have to remember. Okay. <laughs> It's pretty simple, Nancy. It's like yeah. two tablespoons of sodium silicate and uh, a, maybe a teaspoon or tablespoon of soda ash and huh. a, a gallon, gallon of water. water. Yeah, and a gallon of water. So and yeah. so, it really helps bond the. You don't have to scratch in. Um, a good I, idea I do to a, scratch. I do a lot of scratching. <laughs> What, uh, I, what I do with that, what I do with that liquid is I'll, I'll make, you know, I'll, I'll scratch up a slip, basically. Okay. Um, I, I get, I get it. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any um, pieces of your work with the black? The black clay glaze? with the chino glaze on it oh. that you have in your studio there that you could show us? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, try not to trip over any wires here. Uh, 
I should have brought a couple of pieces up from the house here. I've got a couple of, well, some real nice pieces. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's a mug. Ooh, the, wow. The, um, the, you know, the gray part is the Shino, <laughs> and it's on uh, a, a black slip, um, a Barnard Barnard clay slip, and then the bottom here uh, is this D DRSM, which is a, a dark stoneware. Okay. Um, yeah. Cool. And, and the, it just cracks the, like that in the kiln. Uh, yeah. So, well, <laughs> actually, the lines, these brown lines, yeah, are are um, where the glaze cracked as it was drying. So the glaze goes on really thickly. Uh, uh -huh, as it okay. dries, it cracks the way, you know, uh, mud in a mud puddle might crack. And that mm -hmm. allows the underlying slip to come up through the glaze as it's firing. And that leaves those lines. Nice. So it's, yeah, uh, totally accidental, but I love it. It's great. Yeah. Uh, we have time for a story, Ken? Absolutely. So um, I was doing, there was a time when I was doing um, the Bellevue Fair and I was also doing the American Craft Council Fair in San Francisco. And there was a gallery owner that, that had family in Seattle. So she would come and wander around Bellevue. And, um, um, and then I'd see her again in, in a couple of weeks in San Francisco. And at that time I was doing uh, some black porcelain work with some white uh, stenciled ginkgo leaves. And she'd come to my booth and she'd look at my work and she'd say, gee, I really like these, uh, but I can't sell black in my gallery. And um, so that went on for a couple of years. And at that point, I decided I was going to change glazes and clay bodies. And so I, I, I stopped using porcelain. I went to a brownstone where I started using this fake ash glaze and I was using, when I first started out, I was getting browns and greens. And so um, I did Bellevue with that work and I saw the gallery owner and she comes up to me and says, wow, I really like your new work. Uh, I wish you had some black. <laughs> and, you know, so I'm like floored. I don't know what to, to say to her. So I just let it go. And I decided I'm going to make a black version of this glaze and see what happens. Um, and, and so the next year I see her and walks into my booth and nothing. I've got all these black pots, the same, you know, the same thing. And that, it was just like one of those uh, things where she was just trying to make conversation and didn't really have any intent of, you know, actually buying the stuff but but I got a really cool glaze out of it um so we call that Sylvia's black Sylvia Ullman yeah. <laughs> pretty good example oh 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 you were talking about this black yeah that's that gorgeous black. oh yeah okay yeah yeah this is this is your ginkgo pattern oh the ginkgo yeah me, that's a uh, nice black too Beautiful. Yeah. No fail black, I bet. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, um, it's a version of that. I think um, it's, it's a recipe I got from Gary Holt in Berkeley. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, it's it, it originally it was Alberta slip and cobalt. I mean, that's it. Um, and uh, yeah. So Lauren, do you have that pot? Yeah. Do you want to share that now? I think I, there we go. This is a Ridozaki from what? Um, I don't know what year. I have, I have several uh, of these. 80s, 90s? Yeah, 80s. 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 Time consuming work here, Reed. Yeah. <laughs> Gorgeous stuff. 
something else. Man, you you sold a lot of that work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hard way and half fast. Yeah. All right. Anyhow, yeah. You have, uh, or I, I've got a piece that I purchased actually um, at Bryce Point Gal Gallery um, of yours, Reed. That is a, uh, um, it's a nice large tea bowl with a beautiful crackle glaze inside. Um, and just thick drips. Um, is that a real high Nefsi glaze? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Just gorgeous. I was talking about it last week, actually, um, because one of my students was asking about crackle glazes. Mm. And uh, I said, well, Reed's got a great one. Um, but he's firing cone 10, I'm sure. So, Ken, I wanted to ask Reed a question about um, his firing temperature. Yeah, um, please do. Why is, why is he holding out? <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. Um, I'm too lazy to do the experimentation. To... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I, I'm not, you know, at this point, I, I'm not doing... Um, I'm not doing as much work as I've done in the past. You know, I'm not making the volume of pots that I, I did at one time. And so um, it, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's sort of not worth the, the effort to, to change everything. I mean, if I was 20 years younger, well, 40 years younger, <coughs> I might do it. Um, but yeah, at this point, I not, not interested. You don't want to reinvent the wheel. Well, you know, if it's not <laughs> broken, don't fix it. I hear you. <clears throat> it's funny how I came into Cone 6 Electric was uh, basically, um, I was teaching at Bellevue College and we had so much trouble trying to trying to use the, the gas kiln. Um, between credit and, and uh, uh, continuing education that, you know, we just went, I was asked to, to start a Cone 6 program. And um, so I got that started and, you know, I, I kept doing my own work at Cone 10 in my studio. And then when I started teaching at, at DigiPen, I had no time to work in my studio. So I just started doing everything in Cone 6. Um, and, you know, if you play with the glazes long enough, you, you learn how to make them look the way you want them to. So. Um, have you tried, uh, have you done any Cone 6 reduction firings? I haven't myself. That's what we do at Peninsula College here. Uh -huh. um, and I started doing, you know, I my undergrad was at Evergreen with Mike Moran, and uh -huh. that was all cone 10 reduction. And right. um, when I was on my own, I did cone 8 for a while. I can't uh -huh. for life of me remember why I was doing cone 8 exactly, but... <laughs> um, when I was in Colorado and then in grad school, I did a lot of testing and uh, with efficiency and stuff too, and the fuel mm -hmm. consumption of it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's when I converted to cone six reduction and also uh, for soda firing as well. I was really pleased with the results and being done, you know, an hour, hour and a half sooner. And yeah, at least. Um, <laughs> and like 30% less fuel or some, yeah compelling thing that's you know? that's absolutely a, a, a big savings right there 30 yeah. percent is huge yeah i didn't do a ton of research on it but i was you know counting the meter and watching it and i was like wow this is a lot less and it takes a lot of time to figure out the 
it's a whole new glaze palette and a lot of different fluxes. You can't convert all the glazes down to six. Some you can, but I'm, I'm all in it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you all for, for coming. I really appreciate it. And it's <clears throat> always a lot of fun and uh, you will be invited back. So, thank you very much, Ken. Cool. Thanks, thanks again. Really appreciate it. Yeah. It was, thank it was you. Fun. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna check out Ken. Okay. Thanks so much. Really yeah, do appreciate it, man. Oh yeah. No, my pleasure. <laughs>